All right, so good afternoon. This is Chris Roebuck from the Beat HIV Cab. Um, first, want to start off uh, with big thanks and shout outs to Richard, Kareen, Danielle, and Michael for making today possible and for all the technological magic to create this virtual community today. And also, thank you to all the prior um, presenters for sharing their important work. It was a nice bridge from Linda's presentation on standards of prevention to our position paper. And also there's important connections with the discussion that we had earlier on how to address and rectify barriers to clinical trial participation among cisgender and trans women. Uh, next slide, Beth, thank you. So our presentation is Beat HIV, ATI position paper, analytical treatment interruption position paper, perspectives and discussion. Uh, we will be sharing highlights from the position paper and describing the collaborative process of developing the paper. Our position paper emphasizes Beat HIV's uh, community perspectives on the risks and benefits of ATI studies for cure research, uh, HIV cure research, and also provides answers to common questions about uh, ATI clinical trials. So our presenters uh, today, this afternoon, are Bill Freshwater, Beth Peterson and myself, again, Chris Roebuck. Bill is past co-chair of the BEAT HIV Community Advisory Board, and Beth and I are CAB members. Next slide. Thank you, Beth. So the outline of our presentation is we'll first talk about uh, the BEAT HIV CAB. Uh, BEAT is an acronym for Beyond Antiretroviral Therapy. We'll talk a little bit about who we are. We'll talk about why this ATI position paper is important and who is our audience. Uh, we'll discuss the development of the position paper, particularly our process and timeline. Uh, we'll spend some time uh, with Beth and uh, Bill doing a detailed description of the document. We have five modules that they will uh, discuss uh, with more detail. And we'll also uh, talk a little bit about the participant and staff Bill of Rights and Responsibilities that we've also created. And it's our hope that we have enough time for a robust discussion and input from uh, members on the call today. Uh, next slide. So the BEAT HIV CAB, uh, we wanted to share with you our vision statement. Um, our vision statement is a world where HIV and AIDS research meaningfully involves impacted and affected communities and is collaboratively created and openly shared. Our mission statement is, as a Philadelphia-based HIV Cure Research Community Advisory Board, um, acronym is CAB, our mission is to integrate community involvement in HIV and AIDS cure-related research and clinical trials. We also serve as a bridge community to provide input and feedback to HIV uh, projects. And we also foster and maintain communication and partnerships with project researchers in order to promote transparency and to disseminate findings in HIV cure research to our local communities. So I think this is you, Beth. It is, I was waiting for the handoff. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everybody, uh, good afternoon. Thanks for your continued attention this late in the day. Um, one of the features that makes Philadelphia and the Beat HIV community special is we have a community engagement group that is made up of three units with three different sets of responsibilities. The community advisory board provides the perspective that the PIs really need to successfully enroll and outreach to the community. We have the PIs, obviously, their expertise, their scientific knowledge, and Philadelphia Fight, that's our longstanding community partner. And the three units work together to develop uh, this position paper. And our process was really CAB-led. Initially, we identified 48 topics for, that we thought were important to include. Um, and we worked together with the PIs in Philadelphia Fight to consolidate these into 24 so that we didn't have duplication. And ultimately, 
moved those into five distinct modules, which Bill will tell you about in a little bit. We started um, this process really in December of 2017. So this has been a long journey for us. Um, it took us about six months to whittle down those topics, to identify and whittle down the topics. In September of 2018, we started developing the format for the paper and creating the module assignments with different groups within the Community Advisory Board, feeling a stronger affinity to certain subjects. So they joined committees or smaller task forces to draft the modules. And we also spent time gathering information, gathering other position papers, and identifying how we wanted to be different and what we wanted to include. In October 2018, we determined that we should adapt Bill of Rights and Responsibilities from other um, previously created documents, and Chris can talk a little bit about that later, and decided also to include personal reflections from um, participants in ATI trials, some of whom were based at our uh, clinical research sites who've participated in our trials and other reflections were based, were provided by people who participated in other ATI trials that were based elsewhere. So that brought us to, 2000, um, to April 2019, and we took a long time to format module one because we really wanted to get that down, how we wanted to structure each format or structure each module. And then, so we got that down, we moved on to two, and then at the end of 2019, we yeah, finally tuned module three, the Bill of Rights draft, and added the last two modules, which discuss social implications of the ATI and the women's module. I think it's also important to note that while we were preparing this position paper, we also created the Beat HIV Cure Research uh, video series that many of you have already seen. And if you haven't seen it yet, you can find it on beat-hiv.org. Just a little plug for that. But what we, we were very intentional in making sure that our the messaging that was included in the video series was also included to some degree in the position paper, but also it was important for us to ensure that the messages did not conflict. So we were, we looked at the priorities of the content of each and made sure that they aligned. And I think Bill is up next, if I remember the slide order correctly. Yep, there uh, we go, uh, here's Bill. <laughs> uh, hi, this is Bill Freshwater. Um, I also want to start by thanking everyone uh, who really worked very hard to get this switch from a from a real meeting to a, a virtual meeting. Uh, I'm, I was amazed that it happened so quickly, and I appreciate uh, what everyone did. Um, since this is a virtual um, thing, let me disclose: I am a um, I'm a 62 year old gay male who's been HIV positive for more than 30 years. And why this paper is important to me is um, for me. In 2017 and 2018, I was part of the Vedalisumab ATI study conducted by the NIH. And I tell you, I wish I had been able to refer, refer to a document like what we're trying to write when I was considering whether I should enroll in a study. Um, this slide is based on the, uh, the introduction to our paper. Uh, it's intended to help bridge the divide between the knowledge base of potential study participants and the study PIs and study staff. I have to say, at, at, I've gone to a couple of these meetings now, and I'm always really impressed by how much everyone seems to know and understand about what's going on. But I think that we might all forget that a lot of people don't have that clear of an understanding of what an ATI study involves. The whole concept of treatment interruption, going off your meds, and why going off meds is important and necessary. This first version of our paper um, is a reference work for our community and for potential study participants based on input from our community. 
um, it will be very helpful to have something to refer to, something that's driven by your own community, people living with HIV and AIDS, when you're sitting across the table from somebody in a white lab coat. Uh, next slide, please. So who is our intended audience? Early on in our decision process, we as a CAB came to the shared conclusion that this paper should be directed towards potential study participants. If the paper is too dense or too difficult, too scientific, it may not be that helpful. Take, for example, many of the informed consents that we have seen or reviewed. I mean, it's got long lists of potential risks and study procedures using large scientific words. I mean, don't get me wrong, these are important concepts, but if it's not accessible, if it's not able to be understood, it can't be helpful. Our paper will help to demystify this process. Um, in order to achieve that, we're striving for about an eighth grade reading level. This is representative of our, our local community. We also must keep in mind that concepts such as readily available art are not universal. Therefore, this paper is also currently intended for a Western world audience. I mean, to talk about stopping your meds with someone who does not have access to meds is not helpful. Um, it is our hope that this paper, while directed towards participants, will also be used by and referred to by medical and scientific communities. The goal is a paper that will help all parties involved in the study process. Next slide. Um, thanks. Uh, so slide 12, the outline of the document. So um, when we were talking about the process on deciding our topics, we had a funnel. Um, so just like that, our paper is intended to funnel information from the broad concept of what and why down to individual participants' concerns, such as when to stop and restart meds, to navigating and understanding an informed consent. We also included some social issues that are important in our community and probably most communities, things like stigma and mental health. We've dedicated a module towards the role of women in HIV cure research. It is vitally important that gender issues are considered and represented throughout the entire cure process. I know that my study area in Building 10 at the NIH was full of mostly male study participants. Each module includes vignettes or personal stories and reflections by a diverse group of actual ATI study participants or people living with HIV and AIDS. These vignettes are intended to further help demystify the um, ATI and HIV cure study. We've also included a patient's bill of rights and responsibilities. We have based this Bill of Rights and Responsibilities on others that are readily available. I think we can all agree it's a vital part of any document that's going to be used by potential participants. It will encourage them and help them to become their own best advocate. A study, whether it's at UPenn or the NIH or anywhere, is intimidating. You're thinking about trading the security of your undetectable status of being stable on your meds for the unknown. Any participant is risking a lot. An easy to read and understand document that tries to highlight your rights in these circumstances is needed. We also recognize that there are responsibilities, not only on the study participant, but also on the study staff, the study team's staff. This is not an exhaustive list, but it's a good start. And finally, we have included a glossary. I know that when I first joined the Beat HIV Cab, I was amazed at the number of acronyms and words and places that I didn't know. And it's human nature to not want to ask a stupid question, but that's wrong. Therefore, a glossary, not of all the terms, but of the ones that are most important in this paper or in a study or likely to appear in your study documents will be a helpful aid. Uh, next slide. Um, so the format of each module. Uh, okay, wait a minute. Oops, I didn't finish. Sorry. Um, if you can go back, Beth. Sorry. Um, as with uh, all aspects of our paper, we reached out to the Philadelphia community for ideas of input uh, for glossary inclusions. And then for those people who want to dig deeper or need more detailed information, we have included references, of, like some of the things that have been discussed today and the information and slides that we've seen today in the paper. Um, since this version of our paper is leaning towards a Philadelphia audience, we will also have references to service providers in the Philadelphia area. Okay, next slide. Thanks. Um, so the outline and the format of each module. During our process of writing this paper, we had many conversations as how to best structure this paper. 
We decided to set out in the form of bullet points the main topics for each section or module that we agreed to based on community input. Then based on discussions with actual study participants, myself included, we restated these points in the forms of questions, since really that's what a potential participant has, questions. The restating of a position as a question that a person trying to come to an informed decision may ask or may be wondering about will be a helpful tool. Also, we tried to always be mindful of our audience. Accessible phrasing and language are needed. Adding personal reflections written by community members in their own style, phrasing, and language is a way to not only ensure community voices are heard, but also reflected in the paper and to reinforce the questions and positions that we will take. Next slide. So module one, what and why uh, are ATI interruptions in HIV cure-directed studies? This opening module is the big picture, an overview of an ATI study um, and its explanation. I think that, that study participants will be able to grasp what an ATI study is. The why is a harder concept. I know for someone like me, a long-term survivor, or even a newly infected or newly controlled potential participant, the why, Stopping your meds for a period of time, it's harder to understand. Remember, for years, we have been blasted with the concept of take your meds, don't miss a dose, take it at the same time. Now we have a group of HIV experts telling us it's okay to stop your meds. Now, I realize that it's being done under strictly supervised medical conditions, but still, um, after you've been taking meds for so long, it's a, it's a, big, it's a big jump to want to stop your meds. Um, so in addition to an explanation of the what and why, we included a discussion of some of the risks associated with study participation. And as we heard earlier today, everyone has a different idea of acceptable risk. I know that my first few questions when I was sitting at the NIH was, has anyone died? How many people have done this? Did everyone, was everyone able to return to undetectable? Um, and although we're not compiling this type of data, we do have a lot of references as to how to manage risk and what are acceptable ATI criteria. We've heard about some of these in earlier presentations. Our paper has the position that we are applying in the studies here. They include, here in Philadelphia, they include stable su suppression on ART greater than six months, a CD4 count of greater than 450, and the absence of diseases that may increase risks. Um, ATI restart criteria uh, would be after a six-week period of a viral load greater than a thousand copies. Um, we've also included in this section a personal reflection from an ATI participant that walks us through their study and how their, their decisions were made. Uh, next slide. So module two is going down to personal considerations, um, which is a more individualized set of concerns. And now that a, a potential participant is more comfortable with the what and the why of an ATI study, um, we use the same format to address more personal issues. Uh, we tried to narrow down a large number of personal questions to a more manageable number, something that won't overwhelm a reader but will help them. And we went to the community as well as our CAV. We talked about things like comfort level, insurance issues, study completion, possible viremia, who your study contact person is. Um, this is what past and current and possible future study participants told us in meetings that they wanted to see in a paper. Um, remember, our paper is intended to be a living document and these items may change as we move forward. As more people living with HIV and AIDS learn more about ATI studies and more people who have participated in studies talk publicly about their experiences, these personal concerns may change. We have two of personal reflections in this section of the paper, and they deal with prior ATI study participants' experience with viral rebound and stopping and restarting these meds. Uh, next slide. Uh, navigating the informed consent process. We all need to know that for many community members who may be considering study participation, this could be the first time they are faced with such a complex document, and a document that can have a profound effect on their health and their life. Moreover, it can also affect their partner, their spouse, their children, their family, their friends, their social network, and their, and their support networks. I'm sure that many support staff and study PIs may believe that their informed consent document is short 
and not that hard to read or understand. I mean, I get that. Uh, I'm sure research has been and is their day-to-day -day work, but these documents aren't that easy to read and understand. Um, you're faced with new words, words like phlebotomy and apheresis. I mean, you're given, uh, and hopefully uh, all the informed consents include this, a schedule of procedures and tests and appointments that may span an entire year. Um, so I'm an accountant and I like getting in the weeds, so I really poured over my informed consent. Um, funny, I, I remember in the early 90s getting the informed consent form for the salt for immune vaccine study that I was on. Um, I don't think I read a word of it. Um, I grabbed it, I signed it, and I breathed a sigh of relief that I may have a chance at something that's going to help me live and help me fight. Um, it's, it's amazing how times have changed. Um, now, I do realize that nowadays many participants won't or don't read their informed consent. Um, they may, as potential uh, study participants, due to educational language issues, have a difficult time reading an informed consent and actually making an informed consent. Um, so we wanted to have a section of our paper that highlights some of the most important aspects of an informed consent to help people uh, to go through their, their, their forms. Um, and and uh, let's see, we included topics on uh, confidentiality, payment issues, who does the study, uh, how often do I have to consent? Because the consent is more than just a one-time thing. It's an ongoing process. And you make sure that they know to ask for translation services. We included a personal reflection on a informed consent from a trans woman, and uh, she walks you through her path with informed consent. Uh, next study, uh, slide, sorry. Okay, um, social implications. Going on a study, whether it's an ATI study or any study, it's not done in a vacuum. You know, you have a partner, a spouse, children, social circle, primary care doc to consider, to name just a few. Um, going on an ATI study can mean trading your undetectable status for something unknown. Um, our paper wants to make sure that any participant is aware of these additional implications of study enrollment. Things like stigma and mental health issues. What happens if the study is successful? Criminalization issues, which were touched on earlier, and HIV transmission. And I, I know when I first broached the idea of going on a study and going off my meds with my primary HIV doc, he was against it. I mean, I almost felt shamed by his reaction. Why was I going to risk something? Why was I going off my meds? I had to try and explain my desires and my feelings to my doctor. And I, I know or, or hope that he was simply looking out for my best interests, but, but this form of stigma can also come from your spouse or your sex partners or friends. I mean, we get bombarded with ads for easy one pill a day HIV meds, almost like that's already a cure. People may say that you're not only putting yourself at risk, but also others in society. And we think that anybody considering a study needs to be aware of this. Um, but there's also potential benefits that you get from participation. You advance science, you help others. Everyone has their own reasons and all of these reasons should be respected because all of them are important. This, this study module, like all the others, includes a vignette uh, from an ATI participant and covers the social issues that that person dealt with uh, and how, uh, walk through how this study helped him as an individual. Um, I'm, I gotta say that this meeting today has given us a lot of additional information to consider for our paper and has been really helpful. Um, with that, we move to Beth for a discussion of the women's participation. Thank you. Hi everybody, thanks Bill, that was fantastic. I want to, uh, before I get into the meat of this, um, just mention um, earlier today we talked about uh, diversity in enrollment. So I wanted to mention the study that we completed, the clinical trial that we completed uh, two years ago where we enrolled 54 people on an ATI trial, peer-directed trial enroll. We had 11% women, but they, they, and they were all African-American, and overall 80% of our participants, better than 80%, were African-American. So I think Philadelphia is really um, a very special place when it comes to the relationships that we have with our community and our community-based organizations that help us to achieve such such good numbers. 
Um, so moving on. Module five, why is the participation of women important in advancing cure research? So that's really the focus of this module. And again, we're asking questions and that's how we're taking our positions. Why is gender equity important? What are the biological differences? We've learned a lot today, so we can definitely incorporate some things, more things into the paper. Why is it harder to recruit? recruit women? What are the concerns that are particular to women and what motivates women to participate? So one of the things that we've done, and I'm only going to list a few of these because I've got a couple slides of these positions that have been taken in, in the women's module. I think firstly, women uh, pr providers must support the autonomy of their female um, patients by offering the opportunities to engage in cure-directed research. We've seen in different um, different publications where, you know, female or providers don't even ask and don't even talk about cure-directed research to their female participants, and that's really doing a disservice to women who may want to participate. We have to um, meet our women where they are, so we have to tailor our community education and, and engagement efforts to not necessarily just within the clinic walls. We have to go to events. We have to have you know, good participation on our community advisory boards of women, and we have to be very intentional in doing so. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I think that we have to be flexible and mindful in scheduling. It's not, it's very easy to say, you know, we need to have more flexible schedules so the women can participate because of their competing priorities, but there's a spectrum of activities that we need to consider with respect to the scientific activities and the processing and the analysis that has to occur. So I think that that's kind of an all hands on deck process and we have to involve the community advisory board and our investigators to see where those opportunities exist in order to tweak the schedule, to make it more flexible in a way that engages all of the people, the lab scientists who are sitting under a hood for you know four or five hours with a study specimen, how do we accommodate them in their childcare schedules as well? So there are lots of different folks that have to um, be considered when we're talking about this. And I think another important thing when we're talking about flexibility is how do we accommodate women and the different needs? Do we you know, offer an honorarium that is sufficient as it stands now, or do we need to increase those so that women can take care of their kids while they're participating in research? But it's not only taking care of their children, it's taking care of their parents, because as we know, women take care of the whole family. Um, providing additional transportation support, instead of just giving them a SEPTA pass, can we arrange an Uber or a Lyft for them especially if they're taking care of kids and having lots of competing priorities, offering a meal or snacks. We've talked about that. We've had some um, investigators mention that they are concerned with women of uh, reproductive age and um, loss of iron, so they might be anemic during blood draws, But and maybe the scientists will, will have something to say about this, but could it be as simple as offering them an iron supplement for that duration, will that do anything to the other, um, sorry about the motorcycle going by, um, will, that, will an iron supplement somehow throw any of the other responses off? Um, providing a rest area for longer, more invasive visits, ensuring that um, the screening process is trauma informed and that's really important. We have to give women freedom. We have to make sure that they feel safe to participate and go through this process. And is there a way for us to involve their case management team to address any other social issues that could interfere with their personal safety or with study completion? Um, and I think that as a unit, we've decided that we want, we hope that funding agencies would mandate um, equity among gender participation. And I think that that's it for me. There we go, handing off to Chris.
All right. Thank you, Beth and Bill. It's so inspiring. Thank you. So um, one of the appendixes that we have, we've developed a Bill of Rights and Responsibilities for participants and staff. And I really want to give a shout out to our past uh, co-chair of the CAB, Wahida Shabazz L, who suggested that we take this project on. It's been a lot of fun and it's been a wonderful experience. So um, our Bill of Rights and Responsibilities is meant to uh, complement uh, the informed consent documents and that, as Bill has reminded us so eloquently, are complex and often full of difficult and technical language. Um, the Bill of Rights and Responsibilities for both participants and staff um, is meant to provide a short list and discussion of the rights and responsibilities that participants have when volunteering for a BEAT HIV research study. Um, it seeks to provide easy to understand and accessible information that perhaps participants may not receive from study staff. Uh, the goal is to inform participants of their rights and to help empower participants to act on their own behalf, uh, to be their own advocates, and to work in true partnership with study staff. And again, just to um, echo what Beth said, I think we've uh, the Beat HIV uh, CAB and the CAG that we've developed has really been a model for collaborative work and um, HIV care research. Um, so there are 22 participant rights, um, 13 participant responsibilities, and 11 staff and study team responsibilities. And so the majority of the rights and responsibilities that we have developed um, in concert uh, together with our CAG model are pretty standard. We've adapted them from a number of similar documents, including those um, from the HIV Vaccine Trials Network and HIV Prevention Trials Network as well. And we, re we have revised them in the context of ATI trials and in our community conversations. So let me just mention two or three rights and responsibilities from each um, section. Uh, to give us a sense of the document. So for participant rights, we start off um, reminding participants that they have a right to transparent information describing the study process, risks and benefits, and to have all questions answered thoroughly and appropriately at any time during the trial. And as Bill reminded us, as much as the informed consent process is an ongoing process, so is the ability for participants to ask questions throughout the trial. Um, we also, another participant right is free and accurate and regular CD4 and viral load labs, and also detailed information on if and when, um, really when, ART will be reinitiated. Participants also have a right, and this links um, up to uh, Linda's prior conversation, so I really appreciate um, the, the bridge between the two. So participants have um, a right to information on how to access PrEP and PEP services for partners, including direct referrals and warm handoffs to PrEP and PEP services. And also participants have a right to learn of study results from the staff before any public announcements. And I appreciate Bill for reminding us of how important that, that right is. Um, some participant responsibilities include making informed decisions about participation in the study, and also maintaining open communication with study staff, including up-to-date contact information and current medications that they might be receiving outside of the study. Um, a couple staff responsibilities include, which what I think is a major one, is to staff are, uh, have a responsibility to treat participants with dignity and respect and as true partners in the research project. And also the staff has a responsibility to maintain a discrimination and, dis and stigma free environment. So again, these are only a few of the many rights and responsibilities that we've included in the document. Uh, the final product aims to be two pages, easy to read, a uh, relevant bill that can be widely circulated. We like to make sure this is shared with participants, posted on bulletin boards and clinical sites, and also shared with all of you on the call today and also with our MDC partners and other sites conducting cure-related clinical trials. Uh, next slide, Beth, thank you. <clears throat> 
Um, we also have a set of appendices. Uh, the first is a glossary of key terms that Bill um, described. We also have a set of resources that we're making available, which include um, tag cure related resources. Um, big thanks to Richard Jeffries for compiling these. We also include um, access and information to local research, uh, resources, including the AIDS Law Project, uh, Philadelphia Fight, and also Positive Women's Network, particularly the uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania Regional Chapter. And then we also include a bibliography of key articles and papers, many of which we will be um, you know, adding from our conversations today. So thank you all. Uh, next slide. Um, so we want to give big thanks to all the contributors uh, to the position paper for their labor and wisdom, including members of the CAB, our PIs, Luis Montaner and Jim Wiley, who joined us this afternoon, also our community partner, Philadelphia Fight, and also our um, allied consultants, particularly uh, Kareen Dubay. Um, Bill also deserves a really big hand for leading and stewarding the development of the position paper. He's really been a leader and has taught all of us many things as we've learned today on the call. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> Thank you, Beth. Uh, we want to acknowledge support from our sponsors, Wistar Institute, Philadelphia Fight, University of Pennsylvania, Philadelphia Foundation, and of course the NIH for funding the uh, MDC collaboratories. Uh, next slide. And also as a conclusion and an opening, um, feel free to um, contact any of us, uh, Bill, Beth, myself, for additional information uh, to share thoughts or questions that might come up later. Um, Bill's email is at the bottom of the slide, so we invite you to make sure you use it. And we'd like now to move to an open discussion to hear from you. And again, all kinds of thanks for your interest and support. Thank you all for your quick one sec. Sorry about that. Okay, see you in a moment, y'all. My bad. So thank you. Uh, thank you for such an insightful presentation. So the charge at this moment is for, geez, please, for folks on the, on the presentation to offer feedback. Uh, the first question for discussion is what are thoughts on the topics that were covered as part of today's discussion and if there's anything that was missed? So we can go to the chat box and answer any feedback to the beat folks on their presentation today. Just a comment from Richard here. I, th I thought that was fantastic. So, so I could, I, thanks so much. Any other folks want to offer comments? Can, can, we, can I just request to go back to the Bill of Rights slide? I thought that that was so interesting. Um, and I, th I thought this whole presentation was really great. I'm, I'm incredibly excited to see it come out um, this summer, like Chris was saying. Um, I'm just curious when you are thinking about presenting the Bill of Rights as part of the informed consent piece, is it like a joint presentation or is this actually during the informed consent process? So you, you'd basically be doing the informed consent for the study and also presenting the Bill of Rights to participants. So thank you for that question. I think that, you know, there's a couple ways that we want to make sure that the Bill of Rights is circulated and disseminated. And I think the question that you just raised is really important that during the informed consent process that participants are also supplied the Bill of Rights. And it's also our hope that the Bill of Rights will be prominently displayed, you know, in the clinical sites uh, where people are engaged in, uh, in, in the research. Um, is that answering your question? It does, because I, the reason why I bring it up, because obviously these studies aren't going to be happening in isolation, and this type of Bill of Rights, it, you know, isn't widely available in prevention and treatment studies. Not to say that it's not at every site. It's, you know... So I'm, I'm just curious, you know, if it's only getting out in the cure studies, how that will also disseminate into the community 
you know, through word of mouth. So I'm, I'm really just, I'm, I'm super excited um, to see it and to see how it's going to play out um, as people sort of understand what their role is, but then also what they should, you know, expect from, from the study staff. One other comment that I'd like to make with respect to the paper and to the Bill of Rights and Responsibilities, each June, Philadelphia Fight organizes a prevention and outreach summit. And on Friday, we submitted a workshop where for about the position paper that will include the Bill of Rights and Responsibilities so that we can solicit feedback, you know, number one, inform the community that, you know, further inform the community that we're doing these studies in Philadelphia and that we, you know, the community advisory board has created this document and solicit their feedback to see if there's on anything from the community that we really need to include it in, in this. And, and with respect to, to I, I, this is Bill, I, I'd rather, I hope that the entire paper gets distributed and made part of the informed consent process because the Bill of Rights and Responsibility is great, but, but the entire paper has so much helpful information for, for people who are faced with making this big decision that, that I would like to see, and, and I, our CAB has discussed having the entire paper being able to be distributed and, and used in, in conjunction with uh, an informed consent. Right, and we, and we did. We talked about doing that the other day. So we will, it'll have to be submitted to the IRB for review because anything that we give to our participants um, will ha has to have their stamp, but we also, you know, there's no, you know, we, we want to do that. So that'll be put into place as soon as the paper's final. You know, I was, um, happy to see the, the, the slide on women and the reference to, um, accrual people of color. Philadelphia has always had a really fierce and connected African, African American community that's been really involved in all this. But, you know, one of the things that I say to our researchers, I mean, you heard me talk to David about the implementation part of this and how we should start cure research anew. When I speak to our researchers, I always, always say that now's the time to make sure we don't make the same mistakes as we've made in the past as far as um, accrual of women and people of color. So I was glad to see that included. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Linda. Can you see the slide where you have what the model for women would look like? Just really quickly. There we go. Um, oops, let me put this on slide mode. Okay, so I think that this was the first, this is our first slide, and these are positions that we're taking. Um, okay, thank you. Yep. Excellent. I love how on the bullet second from the bottom where you talk about a case management team. I think oftentimes uh, we we make suggestions for inclusion of women in, or to increase the inclusion of women in clinical research trials. And we make sort of singular suggestions, offer transportation, offer childcare. But when we think about it contextually, that's part of a case management framework and the retention of folks in care and the retention of folks on clinical trials is really, I think, uh, an indicator of how well your case management team does what it's supposed to do. So I love how you all make a special bullet point to talk to speak to the, the strength of the case management team and their ability to address some of those social issues that often interfere with participants' ability to uh, stay meaningfully engaged in, in care and clinical trials. And definitely kudos to an 80% representation of African-American women in Philly who joined this dialogue. Big Thank you, up. Dan. So 
Danielle, thank you so much. And one of the things that you're pointing out in that bullet point is one of the things we've been trying hard and working on the position paper is to make sure that it includes a health equity and a trauma-informed care uh, perspectives mm -hmm. in, in our recommendations. And so I really appreciate you notice, noticing that that bullet point uh, that's related to uh, participants' case management is really building upon a trauma-informed care perspective as well. So thank you again. <clears throat> And I also want to thank you because I am a former case manager and we have another case manager on the community advisory board. So we do bring a very special expertise. Awesome. Thank you for your work. Uh, we did have a comment from Jessica who says, I know this was just written for beat, but since the MDCs have sites outside the U.S., it will be great to see how this could be adopted outside the U.S. Any thoughts on that? We couldn't agree more, and that's our plan from having this conversation with everyone today. So thank you, Jessica, and thank you, Danielle. I think Luis is on the call. Does he have anything to add to that? Thank you. Um, no, I think you guys uh, have covered most of it. I just want to sort of highlight the women's participation because it's also systemic within the medical system. I mean, like, for example, we just learned recently that the failure rates for apheresis of women versus men is, is quite high and due to the needles that they use, a lot of the trials would include apheresis as a component of the study uh, plan. So I just want to highlight that we also need to explore uh, all aspects of this, not just the consent and the facilitation of participation, but also whether there's any other point that is unduly unprepared for uh, you know, having women participate equally in the trial. Awesome. Uh, Jeff Taylor had his hand raised. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you guys. This is amazing. And just to kind of build on the discussion around women in trials, I mean, Philly is really kind of an outlier. Most sites do not do this well. And we've been, and not for lack of advocacy, some of us have been advocating for this for, you know, 20, 30 years. And we're really not making a lot of progress, sadly. And I think we really need to start focusing, I and mean, we keep the focus on the researchers, but turn to the regulatory agencies and the funders, because they're the ones who make or break these trials, right? So that's where we need to be getting um, firm quotas and commitments that they're not going to fund a trial or approve a trial if they don't have a statistically significant number of women in that trial. Because I think that's the only way we're going to be able to move the, uh, the needle much further, because the, the advances have been good, but way too slow, and we need to find new pressure points to uh, direct our advocacy to. Thank you for that, Jeff. Another, uh, both kudos and comments. So, Corinne, you did excellent work on the HIV position, HIV. Sure. You I have one additional comment, and the, and it's it's really just, I, I think this is super um, super important work about the trauma centered care and trauma informed space for women. The only suggestion I had, and I wrote it in the comments, was perhaps to learn from prevention and, and in the creation of social spaces for women, like providing support groups and um, just even places to kind of come together to, in, in some African settings, they, they watch like a, a soap opera, the, you know, the, when people are coming in for visits. But just this idea of creating community spaces um, and that perhaps women don't have the same networks of communities that MSM have around the knowledge of prevention trials, so allowing the creation of that community centered around research might be helpful um, and something to consider. You know, Jessica, that those strategies were essential to the um, the Grace study. Once they got pe women in, they found, oh my God, we can't keep them. And once they started doing those those sorts of strategies and and sort of special. Um, tactics to try and retain women that was not as difficult as anyone might think. Exactly. And so I think I, I, it kind of can be incorporated into that engaged potential participants case management team for social issues. But I think making that explicit, like the creation of not just safe and welcoming spaces, but, but the creation of social networks for women. especially those that are sustainable beyond participation in just the trial or around this issue. 
Exactly. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. And again, just a suggestion, but I, I think what you have here is, is really comprehensive and I'm excited to see the rest. Thank you, Jessica. Wow. You have stirred us up today, huh? Thanks, B folks. <laughs> Yay. <laughs>